what is going on everybody my name is Payne and welcome back to another anime review video this is another Studio Ghibli review video I said I was gonna make one so let's just get the intro out of the way and let's just go through with it this is the one and the only Palm Poco. Palm Poco is an action comedy drama film that was directed and written by Isao Takahata, produced by Toshio Suzuki, and was made by Studio Ghibli. It came out in Japan on July 16th, 1994, was released uh, as a dub in 2005, then was released in a Blu-ray 10 years later in 2015, and then G-Kids reissued uh, the DVD and Blu-ray back in 2018, and it's 116 minutes long, or an hour and 56 minutes long. So Palm Poco follows a group of Tanuki as their home is being threatened by construction workers paving their way for a government construction project. But because that in Japanese folklore, Tanukis are seen as mischievous and are known to shapeshift into basically anything, they use their supernatural powers to prevent their home from being torn down. Uh, they pull off these incredible stunts from just tricking the construction workers in order to scare them from working there. It even gets to a point where they actually kill a construction worker to making these uh, this ghost parade trying to scare any of the new people who are living in that area, trying to tell them that the city is haunted uh, with cameos actually from other films like Kiki's Delivery Service, My Neighbor Totoro, Porco Rosso, and... Galaxy Express 3.9 for some reason, but unfortunately the movie does end with their land being paved away into apartments, buildings, and streets as an extension of Tokyo. So there was a few things that I found out, especially with this movie. This is for anyone who, you know, is interested in the movie, uh, anyone who saw the movie, and just some interesting factoids as well, also some opinions that I got out of it, uh, that even though the director, Isao Takahata, came up with the story, it was actually his colleague, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the guy, his name is Hayao Miyazaki. He actually came up with the concept of, you know, let's make a movie with Tanukis in it. And then after making that, he was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have you direct it. But for people who don't know, and this this is uh, a fair number, a Tanuki is a Japanese raccoon dog that is the topic of numerous myths and folklore where they are portrayed as sneaky, mischievous, they can shapeshift and are not really seen as a threat that much because they often eat a lot and party a lot, even though there there are some myths where they do absolutely nothing, and then there are some myths where they actually kill people, so it really just depends on where you find your information. From a modern perspective, for anyone who's really not familiar with from it, one huge example, and I know everybody I know is going to know what this is, Super Mario Bros, when Mario hits the, touches the leaf, Turns into a Tanuki. That's the best example, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they got, I'm pretty sure the people at Nintendo got it from the same exact place that Studio Ghibli and Takahata got, or Miyazaki got Pompoko from, which is from the old myths and folklore. Except Miyazaki had an extra source, but we'll get to that later. There was something that I saw in the film that eventually I looked up more about, and that there were different variations of animation in terms of the how the Tanukis were made. There were three different versions. There was the simple version there was just the normal version of the, of the tanuki how we see them which is just them on all fours running around there's another version which is them on their hind legs dressed up in clothes talking to each other and then there's a third version which is a simplified and cartoony version of the tanukis that were used when they got distracted or in the multiple scenes where they would party all night every time that they stopped and or tricked uh, the humans that are trying to take them out. Uh, this was also a version that Miyazaki wanted in this film as it reminded him of a mangaka that he grew up with who made a story about Tanukis. He was a fan of it. Uh, and I'm just going to let you know right now that I think is the only two times that Miyazaki really was a part of this whole film was that he made up the concept and he wanted like a specific animation in the film. And then Takahata just took the rest of it to his own lane. He just, he just took the rest of it down the road. All right, but now it's getting serious here. There was one scene in Palm Poco that I believe this was the best example of the movie trying to convey the message to the viewer, and it was towards the end of the movie where the Tanukis, they can't really think of any other plans to trick the humans into leaving. They tried the the turning into humans, trying to trick them. They tried the ghost parade. They tried every single Japanese myth and folklore they can think of, and that's not an exaggeration. There is a lot of references towards it, uh, but they decided that they were going to make this big illusion where they turn the urbanized land 
into the forested landscape that it was before the land was paved over to show the humans what was taken away in order for something to be given to the humans in the form of new land and new housing. Then, with whatever power they had left, some of the Tanuki decided to turn into humans for good and live in that society, and the ones that couldn't transform were later just abandoned and just forgotten about. And in response to the forest illusion, the public, they become sympathetic for the Tanuki, but because it's already too late to stop the construction, uh, all the city could do is put up a couple of parks up uh, for the Tanuki to run around. The story overall is about adapting into the future, a message and a mindset that Takahata is very familiar with, where Hayao Miyazaki specializes in directing movies that captivates the young mind and triggers the imagination of the, of the majority of people who watches his films, while also having a timeless moral to every story that he writes, Takahata is not far off from Miyazaki, but not only are his films normally not for young, younger audiences, you can argue in Palm Poco that it is, uh, but also they don't really adapt that well when someone over here in the West watches uh, one of his films compared to someone watching it in Japan, especially with one example that I'm not going to say here, uh, because I want to keep this video up. People who watch Palm Poco know what I'm talking about. You can guarantee people who watch Palm Poco here is going to react very, very tough and strict <laughs> about this certain thing in Palm Poco compared to anyone uh, watching it over in Japan. They're going to think it's a normal thing. But no, back to the main point. Uh, the case here for Palm Poco, in my opinion, is that this movie is a depiction of the advancement of Japanese society, and it's because that the Tanukis represent the Japanese people that Pompoko may not bode that well to mainstream audiences uh, here in the West, but regardless, the message is universal, uh, especially for that time period when the movie came out in 1994, because that was when the world around us was slowly changing, and the biggest thing that really makes a difference now, 25 years later, in 2019, was that the internet was slowly gaining relevance. And Studio Ghibli, for people who don't know, they are really known for <laughs> making films the old-fashioned way. So when Takahata is seeing that everything is slowly turning digital around him, he decided that he wanted to write this movie with a mix of the new, the rise in technology, and the old, which was mainly the Tanuki folklores that Miyazaki basically told him to write a movie about in the first place. Another message that this movie simultaneously tells alongside the forward progression of technology is the backwards progression of nature and the environment that the world started on and is being changed to bring convenience to human beings while also slowly bringing a disservice to natural wildlife. As during the time this movie came out, and even to this day, Japan has had the world's largest construction industry. And while they do have a large number of parks and natural areas today, there is a chance that they might be like a government-issued takedown on those parks. They might take down those parks tomorrow or next week. Or who knows, they might have already done it. And one very troubling example is that the setting of Palm Poco, the soon-to-be deforested area of Tama Hills in West Tokyo, it was inspired by the very same area, the very same place, where in real life, just like the movie, it was also a forested area that was taken down and was replaced by apartment buildings, uh, malls, schools. It was basically its own little town at that point. There's a reason why this is the highest grossing film in Japan in 1994, and that's because Takahata and Studio Ghibli used their platform to make a film that revolves around topics that they believe were relevant and unfortunately unavoidable in Japan because it was starting to be everywhere. And that is, once again, the rise of technology and the supposed collapse of the natural world around them. And while the message that I just explained is very serious. The overall tone of the film, not just when they're portraying the message, has a mix of action, drama, and comedy, and Pom Poco does a really good job of not only balancing them out with each progressing storyline in the film, but also uh, making it their own, making, uh, giving it its own unique way of presenting those tones as well with each storyline. Doing what Takahata's most famous film, Grave of the Fireflies, didn't even attempt to do, which is to give you a support rope after you get dragged down the hole of depression. Because 
if we're really comparing it to Grave of the Fireflies, all that does is just drop you in the hole of depression and keeps you down there for like two weeks. I'm saying that from experience. Unlike in other Studio Ghibli films, uh, in Palm Poco, there is a narrator about most, most of the time it feels like you're watching a semi-documentary, uh, which I completely have nothing against. Just, you know, if you're making this film feel like something different, I think it's a, another unique thing that this film tries to do in addition to expressing its tones very well with each storyline. But if I had to say anything uh, about it, it would be that at points there would be times where I think the narrator was just too repetitive in some scenes, and because of that, it really hurt the character development of uh, the main characters that you see in the show. Other than that, I just, again, I have nothing against it other than the fact that it may have uh, may have coincided with what the film was trying to do but I just overall I didn't have a problem with it other than that and going back to what I said about the diverse animation of the Tanukis that is only a taste of what you get when you watch this film because the animation is as colorful and as creative as you can get with a Ghibli film so much so that again you have cameos from other Ghibli films plus Galaxy Express 3.9, again, for some reason, on this movie. The voice acting was really well done, especially on the dub, because I could not imagine for the life of me how difficult it would have been to dub a film like this, because most of the dialogue is based around Japanese, like, myth and folklore, and you're trying to Americanize it, but not over-Americanize it, and I do believe that the dub, they did a really good job of not going too far with it, but also trying to make an interesting story towards audiences here. Uh, I think they did a really good job with that, and it came out really well considering that most of the cast this time, instead of just being, you know, mainstream actors that are on the big screen, are mainly uh, veteran voice actors who have voiced in cartoons beforehand. Apart from uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who was on Home Improvement, and I think is the kid from The Lion King, I may have gotten it confused with another kid, and J.K. Simmons, who is mainly seen on Law & Order, uh, you have also a number of uh, voice actors as well, veteran voice actors, such as John DiMaggio, uh, Tress McNeil, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Jess Harnell, to name a few. Overall, when it comes to reviewing Studio Ghibli films, just like the last two or three non-Miyazaki films that I've reviewed on this channel, I have no choice but to say the same thing. It doesn't have the foreign appeal of a Miyazaki film, but if you give it the chance, for a select few, this film might be up there as one of their best Ghibli films. Basically, this movie proves to you that a film doesn't have to be fully universal to be fully accepted as a good film. And with that, I'm going to give Pompoko a 9 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you like this video, if you like the fact that I'm talking about Studio Ghibli movies again, hit that like button down below. If you want to see more review videos and more Ghibli review videos, you can hit the subscribe button that's either on the screen or down below. And if you want to see any anime review videos that I made in the past, there are videos on the screen in the description. If you go down to my channel, there will be not more. All of them are down there. Also, I found this out while editing the last video that I found out that after a month and a half, almost two month hiatus, I hit 50 subscribers, which is very exciting <laughs> considering that uh, the future with me in this channel is pretty blurry, but I will absolutely try my best to keep making videos, to keep talking about shows like this, to keep talking about Ghibli movies, and to keep talking about basically anything that I could watch, uh, because I'm having a fun time doing this. I hope you guys are having a fun time finding out some new stuff about shows and movies that you've watched, and with that, my name is Payne, and I'll see you in the next v review video. <laughs> oh, jeez.